Gary, welcome on the show. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Alex. Thanks, man. You too. How's, uh, how's everything over there? Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I can't complain. Good, good, good. Same here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I've been in the consulting and technology space, uh, mainly around uh, fintech or financial technology, a little bit of legal tech for around 20 plus years. Started out in the Lloyds of London market uh, uh, when I was kind of thrown into the deep end when uh, you might remember, but there was a technical insolvency where the entire insurance world collapsed because of massive claims. And I was thrown in as a project manager to help try and pull a team together to resurrect that part of the business and kind of carve it off into what's called a, a runoff. And it was, became the world's largest runoff insurance in this, uh, company. And it, a runoff is very odd because it starts out with large assets and large liabilities, a big company with the idea to shrink it into a small company as opposed to growing a small company into a big company. And that was quite a learning experience. And from that, I, I met a lot of people and uh, got, got into the space. Um, we were uh, doing quite well in London, met a company in Philadelphia who were uh, into the litigation management and spend management sort of technology space, really early adopters, talking about mid to late 90s now. And I really got on well with them. We got on well together and we kind of took a journey. They got bought out by a large company, which is now DXC Technology. Um, before that, it was called CFC, which is a 100,000 employee, $15 billion company. We became part of that for a few years, but to be honest, I became quite jaded in working for a large corporation as an employee. I became frustrated by all the bureaucracy trying to get to help the client and all the, and all the nonsense I had to jump through to get there. So I basically left and then started LSG, uh, which is our, the parent company, the sister company to the other companies we have in the group now in 2003. So what's that, 17 years ago? Um, since that, we grew it out, multiple offices around the planet, um, you know, a few ebbs and flows and ups and downs, but a lot of learning and, and more recently, a lot of really, very cool technology. Uh, we've got a team based um, here in Miami, San Francisco, uh, London in the UK, in Europe, and in, in India. So we're kind of like a little company with a global footprint. I like it. I like it. You recently arrived to Miami, That's correct? Uh, yeah, so about 18 months ago, um, and there's, a, there's kind of like a few reasons why we came to Miami. Um, we'd spent, uh, having spent nearly 30 years in, in the UK near London, um, albeit we had business in, in the US and other parts of the world for maybe say 15 years of, of that 30, um, got married, had ki kids that are now obviously adults and so forth. And we decided that we wanted to kind of, you know, spread our wings a little bit, um, uh, we loved New York. I had an office in New York that was, in fact, our headquarters. So we moved to Manhattan. So we lived in this little sleepy town in England, which has which had 22 houses and three pubs, right? Yeah. <laughs> in into Upper East Side Manhattan. So quite a change. So quite a change for the family. Uh, quite a change for the kids. Obviously, going from private British schools into the U.S. high schools. Quite a change for them. They they did exceedingly well, by the way. Um, Years of that, I decided that 10 years in New York is practically a lifetime. It's a, it's a tough city. And of course, we still have a lot of clients there. We visit New York every now and again, you know, pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID. But moving to Miami was, uh, for two reasons, was not just that we weren't just done with New York. It was, I could sense that a lot of people were gravitating towards Miami. It was starting to become a technology hub, a commerce hub, a, a banking and financial services hub. You know, we've got a few big uh, funds that have moved here and so forth. So... Also a lifestyle change. When I moved out of the city, we're really not city people. So we wanted to have our kind of life back again, you know, the space with the family and so forth. So also other connections in the family is my sister-in-law lives very near, you know, we were very close with them, they're, their family as well. And um, up until last year before he died, my father-in-law was here as well. So we wanted to be close to them. So we literally bought a house two streets over from my sister-in-law, set up an office in Brickell. And, um, you know, the, the Welcoming the company and the business itself has been, has been pretty much overwhelming. You know, one good thing about down here is we have no snow. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. We, we keep a house in Vermont, in Stowe, Vermont, which is the sort of ski capital of the East. 
And I agree with you. Snow is great for skiing and maybe having a snowball fight. Apart from that, particularly the city, it's not good at all. <laughs> I can't. I mean, I never forgot when I did my master's in Ohio and I was scraping ice from inside the car. That was really the top for me. I was scraping it outside. I was putting the chain on the tires, but, you know, it was scraping the ice inside. Was... And your fingers, your fingers were going numb at the same time, right? Yeah, I was using a little scraper, but but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the Northeast um, in the winter time can be quite brutal. Um, so I don't think I miss that side of it. Like I said, I'm, I'm you know I'm privileged enough to be able to go there when I want and maybe go skiing and enjoy that part of it. Uh, but to live in that environment where you're shoveling out of your, you know, the front of your your uh, you know your townhouse in New York on a sludgy morning, forget about it. Hey, I feel you. I haven't lived it for too long, but I did a year and a half up there. So I, had, I got a little taste. Um, so FinTech, right? So you, the, the office here in Miami or, or what you do in general has many aspects, right? When I saw your LinkedIn, you're, you have many different FinTech companies. Should we run down through a couple? You mentioned LSGB in, in your intro. Yeah. So LSG was the, obviously the founding company that we started way back in, in fact, 2002. Um, we started trading uh, in 2003. Um, but we've launched a few companies or spin-outs from that. Uh, they are still the fintech space, but they're different industry verticals. LSG has traditionally been working with insurance companies, corporate legal departments, um, large uh, retail brands that you can come from, whether it's a an airline or, a, or a, a soft drink company or a big technology company. So we've always, you know, come from a background where we work with big companies in that particular space, which is around um, legal tech. And about four years ago, we were pulled into the wider fintech space through getting involved with a large hedge fund, a top 10 hedge fund, who came to us with a particular problem to solve that they couldn't get fixed with other very large companies, I can't name them on this, this, this podcast, of course, but, uh, and they turned to us and said, well, we've heard a good reputation from you guys. Can you, can you help us? They kind of pulled us into that world. And from there, we've spawned another whole division under another brand uh, called Axpire, where we've created uh, other fin applications. So we basically produced, we design, we architect, design, build, and maintain, deploy and maintain fintech applications, software tools for our clients. So legal legal side is dealt with on the LSG and in the fintech side, it's typically dealt with through Axpire. So touching, touching a little bit on the legal tech, what, what does that space mean? Like, can you yeah. paint a picture for us? What does that, sure. what does legal tech mean? Like what's yeah. In that so space? there's kind of two, there's two sides to it for us. There's the side that is client facing. So the client managing its, its, its law firms, and other adjunct professionals in the way in which it manages either litigation or advisory work, which could be, let's say, like M&A or, or something like that, right? Um, so how does, a, how does a large corporation manage their law firms from a, an ongoing basis to say, how are they managing the caseload? How are they managing against budgets and so forth? And, you know, what, you know it's all around kind of vendor management. Um, and I know law firms don't like to be called vendors, so, but I'll, I'll put that out there because it's, it's a known term. So on the client side, it's having applications that can basically enable the client to manage their sometimes global network of law firms in a central, in a, in a central single site, an application, software application. So that's legal tech. Other side of legal tech is what is, what is law firm facing? What do the law firms need? So they have case management needs. They have practice management needs. They have time recording and billing needs. And of course, LSG also provides softwares on that side of the equation too. So we have both client side or client facing software applications to serve the client. And we have law firm uh, facing applications to support the law firms. That's roughly legal tech. And of course, I could go very deep on this and we could spend a lot of time, but um, you know, it's, it's a big space, but it's, it's predominantly both client and law firm facing. Okay. So we have LSG with, with the legal tech, Expire that does uh, financial software development for financial institutions and hedge funds and right. many private other. equity. Private equity. Yeah. 
family office, you know, what, you can put it under the bucket of wealth management, right? So whether it's private wealth management for ultra high net worth individuals or whether it's family offices, whether it's hedge funds. So for example, I'm a global board director of the Hedge Fund Association. Uh, we work very closely with the Miami Finance Forum, which is obviously close to the general financial world. FIBA, the Four International Bankers Association. We sit on the Innovations Committee. So very much plugged into that world uh, here in, in, in Miami. Hedge Fund Association is a global organization. Got it. Got it. I also noticed that you, you focus on saving people money. You're, these technologies help people save money, help these companies save money. Right. So there's two sides to that equation. Mm -hmm. So if you are spending money, as a client, you want to know um, if you can contain costs. So it's called cost containment. And how do you go about that? Um, enabling uh, your staff who are managing relationships with outside vendors like lawyers and others to be able to control or contain those costs is very, very, very important, whatever the size of your organization. So we provide tools that enable things like live budget tracking, making sure that rate management, i.e. what you're paying on a rate card is, is, is tracked, other validations and error corrections, all software-based. We even are now using machine learning and a little bit of AI. So on the client side, they're very keen to contain cost. COVID has obviously ramped that up even further, right? So the demand on that is even higher. Uh, so on the law, firms, law firm side, it's almost like the inverse. It's not as, not as much as you're containing costs, but you're managing against an internal budget that you might set for your team. So you might say, you know, we have a fixed fee case of $50,000. Okay, that's the price we're charging our client. How do I know as a practice manager that my team are not burning through those dollars quicker than, you know, we could burst right through the $50,000 and now we're not making any money. We need to manage budgets internally. So I need to be able to track what my, my team are doing. And it's an acronym called WIP. And by that, I mean, I can then see exactly what's being burned against my budget and ensure that we're going to remain profitable. Also, law firms are terrible at losing money through their billing process. I mean, from the moment they record an activity, say like record time for taking a phone call or something, to the other end where they're supposed to receive the actual revenues from that activity through their billing cycle, they lose on average 8% of gross revenues, which equates to around 27% of margin. That's a huge loss. And they all have this problem. So we focus in on supporting that side of the, uh, the, the law firm equation as well, so that they're, they're not losing or bleeding these losses. Okay. Two questions. Can you hear the kids in the swimming pool? Nope. Okay, that's a good thing. Second. You know what, I don't think it would matter even with the COVID thing going on. We have screaming kids in our web webinars. It <laughs> That's fine. I, I had I was interviewing a, a restaurateur, and uh, he was in the actual restaurant, uh, and the people were walking in the back, and you could hear stuff. So it was it was perfect. It was perfect. And, and besides this, if you hear anything, it will be on my on my because two tracks, my track and your track. I can always muffle my track as you speak, so it's gonna be perfect. And the other thing is, great stuff so far. You speak well and very fast, so. And you answered most of my questions. <laughs> so since I not, since I don't know your industry very much, very well, um, what are other questions that I can ask you so that when we when people listen to you, they can get a All right. So we could picture. we could probably talk more. So we covered legal quite a bit. Maybe we could dive into the sort of fintech hedge fund uh, wealth management side. Okay, so I'll ask you. Like I say, we've been focusing a lot on the legal side. Talk about. What is this, what is we doing in the, in the FinTech space? So that's an interesting, interesting points you brought up there for the uh, legal aspect of it. What about the FinTech? All right, so from basically what we've learned in the legal tech space, we've managed to adopt some of that same, you know, technology base and then use that and apply that into the hedge fund and wealth management space although there's different requirements. So it's not just around cost containment. There's also workflows. There's a lot of due diligence. There's compliance. There's regulatory reporting involved because they're highly regulated, for example, by the SEC or FINRA in the United States, FCA in the UK. So 
There's other requirements also to make sure that things like the expenses that we capture through our applications are then allocated ap appropriately against each of the funds or legal entities against which investors are putting their dollars. You know, if you're investing, say, a million dollars into a particular fund, that fund is then going off and reinvesting those dollars into various legal entities which support whatever those investments might be. You want to make sure that whatever dollars come through that hit the expense side of the fund are apportioned and allocated accurately. We've seen large firms find multi-million, sometimes tens of millions of dollars for something which you might say is an innocuous thing like misallocating an expense, a dollar against the wrong fund. But when you're talking about some of these hedge funds and private equity firms where you're talking tens or hundreds or even billions of dollars, if you get your numbers wrong by just a few percent in terms of allocating expense against the wrong fund, that hurts the investors that are getting over allocations against their side of the fund. So we have very complex technology, which includes algorithms to ensure that the allocation of expenses that flow through the application, application can be um, apportioned appropriately, accurately, and correctly against these funds and or the legal entities behind those funds, which is a little bit of a technical dive there, but I thought I'd try and explain that. So of course, coming from all this process and workflow, we collect a ton of data, and from the data, we provide analytics reports effectively, but also aid the, the client, our clients, to understand what's happening with the flows of the data and the expenses within this sort of software ecosystem that we provide for them. Is there a lot of people in this world? Is it fairly new? We're in the space um, of development. Well, there's a group called fund administrators or fund administration. It's kind of a function. It's like an outsourced service to the to the wealth management space. They do a lot of services based or outsourced like a BPO, but you know, business process outsourcing. Um, but their technology, even though they claim that it's actually very complex and it's very user friendly, <clears throat> is in fact, most, in most cases, certainly those that we come across, including some of the very large shops, not that great. Um, so, that's why we are able to connect ourselves with hedge funds and private equity firms and family offices, even though we're a much smaller company. It's because the user experience and the complexity that we bake into our software uh, is exactly what the client needs without it costing a ton of money by going to one of these fund administrators. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's an interesting dynamic because, of course, we, we end up almost competing with the fund administrators for the same piece of work. Yeah, there's competitors in the space. You know, there's there's those that, that come up against us all the time with uh, in RFPs. You know, clients ask for a quote from three or four vendors, so we're in the mix. We do quite well against our competitors. We don't always win, um, but uh, for us, it's a never-ending cycle of improvement. So it's not like I'm selling you version 1.5 of our software and that's going to be on the shelf for the next, you know, two years. We'll be at version 3.8 in one and a half years. So we're constantly enhancing, constantly improving. Uh, and we do that through client experiences. Uh, they give us the use cases, which is like a challenge to say, can you help me fix this problem? We take the problem away, the use case. Once we fix it, we bake it into the software, makes the client very happy. We have a better product. Awesome. So you get legal, financial, what other areas of industry you'd cover? Um, so it's law firm facing, uh, or I'll call it professional service providers. So we work with law firms, tax professionals. We're getting into the CPA market now, the certified okay. um, public account in this world. And you say, well, what has that got to do with what you're doing with hedge funds or with insurance companies? And the answer is, you may not think a lot, but it's in fact a lot because those law firms and tax uh, professionals and accountants work for a lot of our clients, but they struggle to provide um, electronic expense data. So it all comes down to expense management, invoice and expense management. And so what we do is we provide very slick applications for them to be able to create electronic billing data that the client can instantly recognize, very quickly review and very quickly pay. So we improve their payment cycle. 
So for us, it's important that we can aid the professional service providers to provide accurate and timely expense and billing data into their clients so that they don't lose that 8%. Do you find that it, it's when you acquire new clients, do you normally reach out directly to the, let's say the law office, or do you go through the accountant or do you have to have both of them fall in love with your tech before they use it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it can be, it can be either. And sometimes they're actually, they work together, but sometimes it can be say like the CFO or some, sometimes it could be the head of the, the, the practice or we call a, a managing partner, right? If we're talking about the professionals, um, it's somebody that's typically involved in the profitability of that practice. So if you are charged with ensuring the targets for your practice, your financial targets are met, you have to understand how you go about achieving that how you're tracking it, what technology you've got to use it, how do your staff, um, how, do you, how are you ensuring that your staff are using this technology to make sure that you're on target? Uh, and that's basically what we do. We give them visibility, we give them optics, we give them analytics, like dashboards, right? You know, like dashboard, everybody's into dashboards now. So, and it's not like it's retrospective. We're not like reviewing something that happened three months ago. We're reviewing something that happened 15 minutes ago. So they're able to then respond if somebody is you know, deviating from the goal. I'll, I'll use that as a very general term, but if they're deviating from the goal of the target, then the practice manager or the, or the managing partner is able to jump in and say, why are we deviating? Why is John or Mary deviating off the target when everybody else is on target? So they can really jump on that problem and, and deal with it in a real time proactive fashion. The same approach must be used in the, in the, in the FinTech for the, for the financial industries. I, I'm sure that, I mean, each world is much larger than one thinks like the legal people are focused on providing legal services, the financial services, they're all making money is all about the money. Um, but yet they have to also charge their clients. Correct. Right. So that's depending on how yeah. large the firm is, is, you know, more manpower is allocated to that or, or sometimes yeah. it's a, a small shops talking about small shops. Can anyone use your services? Or, or do you shoot or you shoot for higher, larger companies, mid levels? So there's, there's two answers to that question. Um, on the professional services side. So, you know, what we do with lawyers and tax professionals, that software that can, we have two man band shops. We have very small shops and then we have practices that have over a thousand attorneys and everything in between. Right. So, obviously different price point. If you've got a thousand attorneys per attorney, it's going to be less. Um, but yeah, we serve, we serve a very wide range on the client side. I would say that in the FinTech, so if we're looking at, you know, what's the size of the client that we would typically target as a, as a, as a minimum, it's probably going to be a client that's serving or servicing probably more than $1 billion of assets under management or assets under administration got and it. above. And we have clients that have, tens of billions, many tens of billions that roll up into sometimes hundreds of billions. So what's, what's the next step for you? Well, I think at the beginning of the call, Alex, you mentioned that, you know, you looked at my profile and you can see that there's various threads of things going on that may not be obvious. And you've, te you've helped me kind of tease them out and thank you for letting me explain them to you and your, and your audience tonight. Um, what we decided to do and I'm not giving any trade secrets and I'm not going to give any details is that we want to make sure that the messages that we give out from a marketing perspective, like on our websites are very clear at the moment. We are targeting certain industries with certain softwares under certain brands under certain legal entities. So again, I don't need to name the product, but you said, you know, one of LSG's products is such and such. We're targeting a particular client base. Axpire has a, a number of products it's targeting FinTech clients. We're going to start coalescing. We're going to start aggregating um, around both the product names and in fact, the entity name. So we're going to start rolling this into a group structure so that rather than having multiple legal entities with their own products serving different industry verticals, we're going to bring that under a common umbrella and a common brand naming convention. Okay. Do you have any, a time frame for, for this project? 
Yeah, this will be done before the end of Q4 2020. So we'll come out of the gates in 2021 as a, I'm not going to say brand new shiny thing, but effectively it will be much clearer from our client audience or audiences as to who we are and what we can deliver. I'll just say it like that. Okay. We'll look forward to that. Let me know. Maybe we can do another another show and focus on that. I'd love to share it with you. None of this is public yet, so I'm just giving you kind of the you know rough kind of draft here. But yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. So I know that we're running out of time, and I don't want to keep you too long. What has been the impact of COVID in the industry? All right, so I think during the early months of COVID, as companies got used to kind of uh, the lockdown and having to work from home and this all room working, and some were better than others, um, it, was, it was very, uh, I guess, fortuitous for us in as much as, as a technology company with, you know, a disaster recovery plan baked into our operating model, for us to move to a remote uh, um, working mode was not that difficult. A few little hiccups. Did everybody have enough laptops, you know, and the bandwidth of their internet, all that kind of stuff, little niggly things. But apart from that, we were kind of good to go. Many companies weren't prepared for that. Uh, and, and that caused them a bit of a hiccup. And I think the impact of that, and then betting into sort of starting to work from home and, you know, using Zoom and the other kind of online meeting channels and stuff like that, that also took some time. That slowed down decision making. So, you know, I'm not able to kind of go to my client's office and look in the eye and shake their hand and say, yes, let's do this deal because you couldn't do that. You can't do that with COVID. So that I think had a delaying impact. The other impact I think, uh, which has been positive for us that this issue of now I've got time on my hands, I need to start looking at what I'll call operational optimization efficiencies, whether it's cost containment or whether it's digitizing a process, which is currently manual. Of course we do that. We're basically a digital transformation company. That's actually been very positive for us. So we've been busier now on the marketing side than we've ever been in the history of the company. Okay. And I think that's down to kind of like what happened in the post, um, you know, global financial crisis, the GFC time. When times are hard, people focus inwardly on their operating models and efficiencies. But when times are good and there's tons of profits and we're all eating out of the trough, it's all front end loaded, like you said earlier, and nobody really worries about the mid and back office or the operational efficiencies. Um, COVID has had an impact where people are starting to look more closely at that and that's helped us. That's benefited us big time. So that's kind of my spin on it. You mentioned the, the person to person, how important would you say person to person is in the financial industry? Being able to be there with your client, talk to your client in person for you or, or for your area. Yeah. So to me, to me, that's a very human question, not Mm. necessarily a business question. Um, I'd like to think that I have kind of what I'll call good radar. It's kind of like a sales technique where you need to be able to listen to your client. Um, uh, if you can look them in the eye and you can see how their what their body language is and how they're behaving like that, you can sense things as a human being, right? If you don't have the ability to, if you, even if you're on video, it's not the same thing. So let's just say you're not on video and you can, you can just hear them. Being able to understand their tone of their voice to be able to get a grip on how they're viewing either how the call's going or, you know, what you've proposed. You have to have, it's, I think it's heightened your listening skills. It's heightened, it's fine tuned your radar, so to speak, right? Mm. To be able to understand, okay, I really need to listen now. Um, And I need to get this out of the nuances of the voice of my client, be able to understand how this is going, what they need, am I responding properly, what they need next and that sort of thing. In terms of the sales event, like closing a deal, yeah, I mean, I'm, I like the warm and fuzzy. I'd like to, you know, be with my client, have a relationship with my client, know my client, because we don't have three-month relationships. We go through, we, we meet them, we go through dating, we go through courting, we get married, we have kids, we have grandkids, it, and it goes on, right? So these are yeah. long-term professional relationships, um, you know, multi-year relationships we have with our clients. It's, a, it's, it's, it's that kind of process. So. I think the COVID um, impact of not being able to do those, you know, meets and greets and all the rest of it, I'm, I'm a little bit saddened by that. But, um, you know, we know our clients quite well. We keep in touch uh, very regularly. Um, but I, I do think that's had an impact on, on closing deals simply because you don't have that face and that rapport 
that you're able to build up, particularly with new clients that you don't know yet, right? You're still building these relationships. Very difficult to build relationships when you're talking over LinkedIn or Skype or Zoom or something, right? So, I agree. I agree with you. I think the personal connection with people being there in, in the same space is, is never going to go away. I think all these tools yeah. that we're using now because of the virus um, yeah. have made some things easier, um, but you're still going to need that personal connection, at least initially, at least initially. And then every once, every so often, maybe I'm not going to go to see you every month, you know, but uh, like I used right. to, yeah. but at least, at least that first initial, and then maybe, maybe six months, maybe, you know, I'm sure every industry, every company will adapt. And, but I think the personal touch is always going to be important. It's always going to stick around. Uh my last client face-to-face -face meeting, which was with an existing client in Chicago, it's a, it's a big airline. Um, obviously they're having, you know, they've had some real difficulties, but was in January, around January 16th, 17th, uh, about, um, uh, about a month before we kind of went into lockdown and then started working remotely. Um, I've been a person that's been traveling internationally for 15 years and normally my suitcase, my favorite to me bag has been next to my bed, half empty or half full, ready for the next trip. I haven't seen that luggage for seven months. <laughs> Crazy, no? Hopefully, hopefully we can That's, bring that back. Well, there's some good sides to that as well. You know, I think you you know you're a lot closer with your family. We've had our True. our kids here for for months on a, on a, on end, which is great. We've managed to get on and work together. So, yeah, um, it's, it's it's a different dynamic. I don't think the situation is going to change anytime soon. You know, forgetting about what you hear on CNN or BBC or you know, any, any other news channel that begins with an F um, that I never watch. Um, but, you know, unless there's something that's usable and it's safe, I think we're in this for probably another year with regards to, you know, wearing masks, social distancing, and all that kind of good stuff that we do to respect each other's uh, health. Probably. No, I agree. I agree. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much for taking that time and joining us to sharing your story by coming to Miami and the services that you provide. And we wish you the best and thank you for choosing Miami. Well, thank you, Alex and uh, Miami Global. That, um, it's been a great, um, a great little podcast here and I'll, I'll definitely avail myself when, you know, uh, there's things that are changing that uh, are perhaps no, uh, newsworthy or noteworthy. And thank you so much.